Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark, and it's for art. Um, found my glasses. <laughs> Pretty happy about that, actually. They fell behind a chair. I took it out to vacuum it, and there they were. So I'm going to continue reading uh, this um, oral history by Dr. John Goffman. It's uh, Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years. You know, the thought occurred to me, I wonder what the later years are about. I guess we're seeing that now, aren't we? So let's go back. I'll finish reading this. I stopped in the middle of the chapter. I was just so tired the other night. So let me continue. He said, well, fallout's important. How would you like to work on... Let me take that out. How would you like to work on big problems like that? Build your own staff. All the people you want to get and bring in. You'll have the best facilities in the world. Livermore does indeed have the best facilities. They'll build you a building, Foster said, and indeed they did. He said, you don't have to worry about your budget. The money is just about automatic. Well, maybe not so now. I said, I don't think so, Johnny. But I did bring a few guys who had gotten their PhDs with me to talk with him. He said, will you do me a favor? Will you write up a protocol of what it would be like if it were going to be done, even though you don't want to commit to it yourself or have anything to do with it? So I did that. I thought about it, and there were some very attractive features. About $3.5 million budget each year, a new building, and not having to worry about grant applications over and over again. So what can I say? Somewhere along the line, I had a lapse of cerebration, cerebration, S-C-E-R-E-B-R-A-T-I-O-N, cerebration. I said, I will do it. Oh, dear. The money works, eh, dude? We had to go then to, the wa to Washington to sign the papers. At that point, Glenn Seaborg, my former mentor for my PhD, was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission and had been there since President John Kennedy was inaugurated. Theos Thompson was a commissioner. I've forgotten the names of the other two. James Ramsey was a commissioner. He was not there that day. Wally Renner, Reynolds and John Foster and I went in. Seaborg had Chuck Dunham, by then the head of biology and medicine, had replaced Shields Warren, who had retired, and some others in the room. We were supposed to drop the papers and sign the papers to establish that I was to become the head of the new biomedical division and an associate director of the Livermore lab. There are 10 associate directors. I said, I would like to make a statement. I hadn't talked to Johnny about it at all. Glenn Seaborg said, go ahead. And I said, I would like to say, I don't really care. I don't really give a damn about the Atomic Energy Commission's programs. I care about public health. And so what I want you to know is you're asking me to set up a division to consider the health effects of atomic bomb tests, uses in nuclear war, nuclear power, peaceful use of explosives. We'll investigate these problems, but you're not going to get me to be silent and use the secrecy stamp to keep something from surfacing I think the public ought to know. Hmm, a man of integrity. I said, so I said, having said that, I think you should think twice about whether I'm the right person to head this program. I made it very clear exactly how I feel about it. Glenn Seaborg said in memorable words, Jack, all we want is the truth. If I'd seen, if I'd ever seen the opposite of reality, this was it. So we signed the papers. Everything was hunky-dory. We got the budget. I brought out the 35 senior people from all around the country. They had either gotten their degrees with me or I knew them. We built a division of 125 to 150 people in the whole division, lots of, in the whole division, lots of engineers who were working on fallout and weapons testing. I made an agreement with John Foster that I would only have to be the head of the department for two years because then I wanted to get back into the lab. That agreement was honored. 
I was the head of the department for two years, but I remained an associate director for the whole Livermore lab after that. Everything went fine. Now there's a new subtitle. Livermore Biomedical Department's work on fallout and plowshare, 1963 to 1965. Gorley, could you describe some of the work and some of the programs? Goffman. We had a number of people trying to find out things about the whole distribution of radioactivity in people and animals. Arthur Tamplin headed a part of our project, which was called Information Division, pulling together all the world literature on this. Another part of our program was trying to work steadily on unmasking the evidence concerning human radiation effects and trying to build some generalized idea of what the health effects of radiation were. I worked on that with Art Tamplin. Bernard Shore headed the experimental division where there were all kinds of studies being done about radioisotope intake in animals. We had an animal farm there at Livermore, as a matter of a fact. So everything was dedicated for the lab to know at the cellular level about the meta metabolism of radionuclides and about radiation effects on the analytical level taking all the information from Hiroshima, Nagasaki, from studies of women who had t tuberculosis and later developed breast cancer. Alice Stewart studies. Court Brown and Dahl were publishing on people who had been treated with massive doses of x-rays for a disease, ankylosian spondylitis. This is an odd one. Um, it's a form of arthritis of the spine. X-rays helped that disease, so they were getting cancers, and that was being published. So on the back burner, Tamplin and I were trying to pull all this stuff together. Gorley, what was on the front burner? Goffman, front burner were all the things that the Nevada test site and the animal data from the work in the lab. Everything went fine. One of the first projects was to investigate, as an offshoot of Sedan, whether we should dig a Panama Canal with a 301 megaton hydrogen bomb. That was Edward Teller's favorite baby. We went out there in 63 and were doing a lot of consideration. Gorley. Sedan, the Sedan shot by July? Goffman, about 1962, I think. Okay, said Gorley. Goffman. We were doing an evaluation of plowshare explosives, and in particular, the idea of the Panama Canal. The director's meeting went very, went, excuse me. The director's meetings were every Thursday morning, and the 10 of us got together with John Foster, who then, by the way, went off to Washington in spite of the fact that he was never going to go to Washington. Michael May became the director of the lab. I had very good relations with Michael May. Everything was fine. You notice he keeps saying that, everything was fine? <laughs> that sort of leads you to believe that something's coming up, that things weren't going to go fine soon. Within three months of being at Livermore, I got a call from Chuck Dunham in Washington. He said, can you come in next Tuesday? I said, what's up, Chuck? <laughs> he said, I can't discuss it on the phone, but would you come in? I said, yes. I went to Washington. Five others and I were there. None of us knew what Chuck wanted. He said, we have one hell of a problem. We got this guy, Harold Knapp, in our department here in Washington Biology and Medicine. Harold Knapp has done some calculations about Utah. He calculates that the doses some of those people got from radioiodine seems to be a hundred times what we said anybody could get. Dunham said, he wants to publish it. So I said, so? He said, look, if Harold Knapp publishes, publishes that, all of us at the AEC are going to be made out to be liars. We can't tolerate that. We said, what do you want us to do? Dunham said, I want you to talk, this, talk to this guy and see if you can change his mind about publishing it. Here I had been three months before, Chuck Dunham was sitting in the back of the room listening to me say, I'm not going to be manipulated. And here he is with a request that we help him manipulate somebody else. 
Harold Knapp came in the room and Dunham left. Boy, Knapp was bristling. He told the six of us in a group to go to hell. We said, calm down. Dunham just asked us to look over your work. When he had calmed down, we checked his work. That wasn't unusual for a group to look at a specific thing. He was very sound. I think there were a couple of minor points that someone suggested. He agreed it was a good change. We told him, go ahead and help your publisher report it. So Knapp left. Dunham checked in on this, came back in and said, well, Chuck, we can't find any reason why Harold Knapp shouldn't publish his paper. He was just beside himself. He said, we're going to be a bunch of liars. We said, the AEC will weather this. They've weathered all kinds of storms before. Then they'll, they'll weather this one and it won't hurt a thing and just go ahead. So he did. The sky didn't fall on the AEC. I think these bureaucracies, I think these bureaucracies, nothing ever affects them. But here is the first time, three months after I'd gotten there, they're asking me to help do a cover-up. But that all died down. Knapp published his report. Then about 1965, I decided I ought to talk at the director's meeting on the Panama Canal. I said, the conclusion of our biomedical division is the idea of digging the Panama Canal with hydrogen bombs is biologically is biological insanity. Let me repeat that. The idea of begin of digging the Panama Canal with hydrogen bombs is biological insanity. Edward Teller was unhappy, but nobody else said a word about it. I got a little flack later when the in the lab with hearing rumors that Goffman was the enemy within because the lab was dedicated to the plowshare pro program. Gorley. Now what about Project Chariot? There were some biological studies associated with that too. Goffman. I don't remember anything that we had to do with that. There were tests in Alaska. I just don't remember details about it. But we had a test in Colorado breaking up some natural gas formations underground with nuclear bombs. There was a lot of radioactivity that came out of those, and I don't think those were, in, were a good idea at all. But most of that died with one thing, namely when the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty was signed. All plowshares activities had to cease because they figured that other signers would say, look, you say that's for peaceful nuclear explosions, but how do we know it's not for weapons tests? So they quit all the projects associated with plowshare. Plowshare just died in 1965-66, as far as I can remember anything about it. We certainly don't hear any more about the canal. Gorley. I wasn't sure that some of the treaties got rid of the above-ground testing. Goffman. The underground stuff, that was a separate treaty. The Limited Test Ban Treaty, signed in 1963, got rid of the above-ground testing and permitted the underground. But you couldn't test underground on a plowshare program. That was just a way of covering up the weapon testings. That was a little later. So we weathered the plowshare thing. How many minutes? We're at 13 minutes. Um, I think I'll stop just for the brevity of it all. And um, I'll post this up so that we'll have one. Maybe this evening after I finish up my work, I'll come and do another reading because I know it's been a few days. So... Please put your courage feet on, folks. Can you believe this? Underground testing, above ground testing, and uh, the lies, the continual lies. 90% rule. Ciao.